Hey guys, Rorius here. Welcome back to Half-Life 2 Episode 2, the developer commentary playthrough. <laughs> now, just a little disclaimer at the start of the video. I am about to get very sick, so I'm recording things ahead of time. This episode will probably come out in a few days, so I do apologize for any... Oh god. <laughs> the level load was right there. Okay. I'll see how far I can get for today, but I do want to record a bunch of things today before my voice completely goes. The, whatever I have is what I, my dad had, and when he had it, his voice completely disappeared. He l almost completely lost his voice. So I'm going to try and record a bunch of vi videos before my voice goes. <laughs> I've taken a few liberties with your car. Check it out. I added a rack for Magnuson devices back here. Yeah. Yeah, so this thing, this little Magnuson holder... I tweaked your onboard radar so the combines show up red on the dashboard unit now. Plus, yeah. send a homing signal to your HEV suit in case you get separated from your car. <laughs> no need to thank me. That's right. Yeah, this little check this map. HUD thing at the very bottom of the screen. We're right here at the south end of the <laughs> valley. The rest of the gangs up north by the old sawmill here. Head on up there, yeah. and they'll fill you in on the battle plan. I'll be staying here to watch the field and send status updates. This is a very basic map. It does not show any of the hills, really. <laughs> Alright, let's listen to these nodes. Shush. We wanted players to use the car as much as possible, both to move around the valley quickly, and to run over the hunters as a quick and satisfying way of killing them. Right. To encourage this, and to help with orientation problems, we added radar to the car. Mm. which indicated the location of enemies. This made the car a more valuable tool in the battle and solved the navigation problem once and for all. Right, right, yeah. I mean, yeah, because you need something to navigate this area. It's not a very straightforward location to move around in. <laughs> One problem we faced in this map was that players would abandon their car in the heat of battle and not be able to find it later. Mm. Given the time pressure and large scale of the map, some of these players couldn't succeed in protecting the base on foot. Yeah. To address this, we started by adding flashing hazard lights to the car, which helped when the car was in view, but mm. we still saw players lose the car among the trees or behind hills. Yeah. Eventually, we added a vehicle locator to the player's HEV suit, so players could find the car wherever it was. Yeah. I mean, it's not a very elegant solution to the problem, but it's probably the only real solution you can get. Okay, let's move out. This is going to be a full-on combat scene. You'll find the sawmill at the far end of the valley. Why, thank you, good sir. Yeah, so it's actually a good idea to explore the area first, just to get an idea of where everything is. There's these two, like, barns immediately close to Perimeter's the... Perimeter's clear. Still no sign of incursion. Yeah. Keep alert. There's, yeah, there's those two shacks there, and then the, you reach this, like, middle part of the map and you've got the the like this whatever this shack thing is this hut thingy <laughs> and you've got another house little house and then there's like yeah they've got different areas in this map that have different like names the massive strider battle was in production longer than any other map in the episode tuning it required many many months of testing and iteration to address playtester feedback and this was complicated by the fact that every time we playtested we saw individuals adopt completely different approaches to <laughs> defeating the striders yeah some threw logs at the hunters others relied on their rebel companions to kill them some players never sprinted while others never used the car we tried <laughs> to keep supporting all the different strategies that occurred to players so that their experiments with tactics would be rewarding rather than frustrating Meanwhile, right. we had to make sure the strider and hunter behaviors were consistent and balance the experience so that it would be great for all different play styles at every skill level. Mmm. Yeah. I noticed I've missed a node. It could just be elsewhere in the map, but I'm gonna have a look in these little huts. Here we go. Before we create any final art, we use placeholders to see if the gameplay is working and to figure out the proper dimensions and shapes for the model. In this level, we used an old pumpkin model as the placeholder for the Magnuson device. <laughs> yeah. After we decided that the gameplay was fun and the pumpkin worked well, a proper model was created using the pumpkin as a template. Yeah, so this is the pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I like that the explosion still almost looks like a pumpkin exploding. That's funny. So yeah, we've found node 3 and 4 now. I'm gonna try and find as many of the nodes as possible before we start the battle. I can see a node in the distance over there. But there's also one over here, I can see. So yeah, this is the, sh the shack to the uh, west of the map. A great deal of work went into making sure players would see the buildings get destroyed as they travel around the valley mm. in the final battle. Yeah. While we cannot and do not wish to force the player to see these events, we try to increase the odds that the player would end up in the best possible position for the show. Mm. Measures ranged from simply hiding a strider behind rocks to setting up complex logic conditions that must be met in order for the destruction to occur. Yeah, so examples of that I think are that you this will, this shack will never be destroyed when you're not able to see it. I know I've had it I remember when trying to get that achievement to where you don't lose any of your shacks. I several times like found myself in a situation where I knew the shack was going to be destroyed. They're waiting for you in the but I mill. I was that desperately way. avoiding coming close to it because I was like, "Oh no, if I get close, it's going to immediately be destroyed." And I actually found a way to destroy the strider before it destroyed the shack. I managed to get it in a situation where I could see the strider before I could see the shack. So I was able to launch the strider uh, exploder thing onto it and destroy the strider before I got to destroy the shack. It was complicated, but I'm glad I you know, went through the effort to do it because that's a tough achievement to get. Okay, let's listen to this one by this big barn shack thingy. Players under pressure can overlook basic tasks so we try to make the important ones foolproof. On this map, players often forget to check your health level, but rarely forget to seek out Magnuson devices. Mm. We narrow doorways and set health supply racks right by the entries, so that players rushing in yeah. to get explosives would find themselves automatically picking up vital supplies. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually quite clever. Quite cleverly done. The sawmill is that way. They're expecting you. Yes, yes. <laughs> Let me... Give me a minute. Okay. The hunter's escort behavior includes specific formations and flanking strategies. This environment was designed specifically to enhance those behaviors by providing cover and visually interesting paths. In this way, mm. the environment reinforces the design of the hunter as stealthy, aggressive, and intelligent. Right, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So once again, like a further AI showcase. <laughs> okay, before they start talking, I'm gonna pause the AI actually. Episode 2's rocket defense battle was the largest and most non-linear combat experience we had built. It was also the first combat we created that required the use of a vehicle to move from battle to battle. Our right, design goal yeah. was to give players a broad directive, protect the rocket from incoming striders, and let them decide how to accomplish that. Playtesting revealed a number of challenges that we had to overcome, as the freeform nature of the map led to huge variation in success for different players. Small differences in skill or tactics radically changed the difficulty of the experience for players. Mm. In response, we had to continually tune all aspects of the experience to support the wide variety of tactics and skill levels demonstrated in playtests. Yeah, this is the kind of thing that's really difficult to properly tune, because yeah, there's so many different strategies for doing this mission, I guess you could say. Many players had a hard time orienting themselves in the valley. Before the fight, we send players to the sawmill without telling them how to get there. This yeah. was a way of familiarizing them with exactly the what map I was without before. any time pressure. Oh, Still, God. the size and nonlinearity of the map was confusing for first-time players once the battle began. The loudspeaker announcements that direct players to incoming striders initially referred to compass directions, which most players couldn't follow because they couldn't remember which mm. way was north. We added White Forest Peak as a global landmark and distinctive local landmarks like uh, the cranes yeah. and the water tower and refer to those landmarks in the announcements instead of compass directions. This helped, but some players still had a hard time knowing which way to go at any given moment. Our ultimate solution was the car's radar, which, along with the landmarks, helps players go where the action is. Right, yeah, because I believe it shows you, although I don't see it at the moment. Oh, I see something, sorry, at the moment. This is like a triangle. That's weird. Um, yeah, they basically they've put the uh, the enemies on the radar so that you'll know which direction the enemies are coming from. What would have been interesting is if they had a little map in the car as well that had like the cranes and sawmill 
on it, I don't know. I, I just think there are other ways you could have solved. They, they, you know, they could have solved some of these problems, but not all of them. Not all of them. Come closer. So they've sent Freeman, have they? Good man. <laughs> We've counted a dozen Striders just north of us. Our job is to keep them from reaching the base to the south. Mm. If they get close enough for one good shot at the silo, the whole launch is a bust. And in case Striders aren't bad enough, recon indicates they're being escorted by packs of hunters. Now, what I want you to yeah. attention. Uh -oh. North perimeter breach. <laughs> We have a strider approaching from the cranes. Defensive position, go! Yeah. I think you can get this guy straight away, can't you? We Oh dear. I haven't dealt with these guys yet. Yay! I did it. <laughs> yeah, so now now basically there's gonna be a ton of this. I hate running with stuff with the, on the gravity gun. Ah, uh, see, this is why it's so hard to do that mission. Where you, you know. Oh, what? It landed on the Strider, but it. Oh my god! Back it up. <laughs> oh shit! I forget that that happens. God dang it! Get in there. Come on. <laughs> God damn it. Put this in here. Get up close to the strider. I believe he's hitting this way. Come on. Don't shoot the Magnuson device. <laughs> I should put my crosshair on. Yeah, see, if you can keep the sawmill going, then you have a, a you know, a good Magnuson device spawner right at the end. Ugh, okay, well I lost the sawmill. Yeah, I know the layout of the map now, so I don't have any problems with them talking about the sawmill, water tower, whatever. Oh, it's this way. <laughs> I thought that was the entrance by this by the water tower, but the entrance by the water tower is this one. No, oh, I ran past him. Okay, let's get the shotgun out. Because <laughs> you basically can't shoot. Ow. Basically, you can't shoot, um... Okay, let's get to the Strider quickly, before he takes out another building. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> okay. Let's get to- I believe this triangle is like the middle marker? Or is it the base marker? I don't know. Wait, did I pick up that Magnuson? I don't even know if I picked up the Magnuson device. If I didn't, I'm gonna have to... I did pick it up, okay. Okay. He's a little further over, he's a little further over. Let's get one of these hunters, now. Oh, what the? Did not mean to get this out. Okay. Being behind the Striders is pretty good too, because they will not fire at you, of course. He says that, but then there's a big pile of them that he did. Oh god, I climbed that tree. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, so having having all the uh, stuff to replenish your... What the? Ah, oh, for what used to be the sawmill, he says. Um, yeah, the... What was I saying? Um, oh yeah, having all of the resources right next to the... Right next to the doors of all the houses makes it so much easier to not- you don't have to worry about pick, picking up the resources because they're just already there. Now we have a strider coming in from the water tower! 
Oh, the bastard dodged it. Oh, I'm out of shotgun shells. Um, do I have... There we go. That works. <laughs> Take that. But now I've got one coming in by the water towers. So, I don't have a Magnuson yet. I'm gonna go ahead of it to get the Magnuson. Oh my god, another one. Ah. <laughs> I'm gonna lose another building. See. Get the freaking hell out of the way. <laughs> Pick it up. Yeah, this is why it's so so important that you have the water, the um, sawmill. Once you get rid of the one that's going to destroy the sawmill, see the one by the water tower. Sorry, by the cranes is already um, at that structure. What the no stru no um hunters. Okay, I can see on my radar that the one by the cranes is already at the little shack that it stops at there. Those two, the sawmill and the shack on the on the western side of the map, those are the absolute hardest to not let be destroyed. See, he's about to, yeah, there we go. There we go. Um. Okay. Before you can do any more damage. There we go. Yeah, so I've lost two buildings. That's usually all I lose. But we'll see. We'll see how I do this time. Okay, well, I don't know which way the next one comes. I'm gonna go down this middle part. It's always good to head towards the end of the map because that's where they will spawn. Okay. Another strider from the water tower. Well, good, good timing. I just went to the water tower. I was getting very confused as to why nothing was spawning. Oh, what the hell? Okay, that strider's is gonna get too freaking close to the next section. He's probably going to destroy. The next tower. Yeah, he's he's got there already. When they do that, when they do that like low crab walk thing, and you don't immediately get the Magnuson on them, you can't stop them in time. They get they just go too fast. Yeah. Well, shit. I'm doing worse than I normally do. Yeah, and it destroys the little device that gets you it. Shit, I'm doing badly. Looks like that was the last one. No. Wait a minute. Get ready, everyone. We've spotted drop ships carrying even more striders. We have about a minute before they hit, so gear up. This is yeah. gonna get ugly before it's over. Yeah, I'm not projecting that I'll do particularly well. Because there's two shacks and then there's the base. If they come quickly in any sort of fashion, I'm done. I'm so done. Yeah, I believe there's- is it three? Or is it just two? I can't see a third one, but there might be a third one. I knew it would end like this. <laughs> I wish you could drop the Magnuson devices, but they break so easily. Oh, okay. Ah, oh, see, there we go. It broke. We have a strider coming in from the crate. Okay. It's the damn hunters that wreck everything for this. Because they the just... Yeah. The hunters, um... Oh god, oh god. Oh my god, damn it! Okay. Okay, 
I think there is three of them. But hopefully they're going slow enough that I can get them in time. Yeah, and if you freaking miss. If you freaking miss a Magnuson device. Shot. Then you're done. <laughs> you're done now. No, no way to be seen. Okay. God damn it. And now that I had that shack missing, god damn it, it makes it so much harder. It's, it, ex it gets exponentially harder with every shack that you lose. So if you still have the sawmill, they actually don't, the ones that come afterwards don't attack the sawmill. So they, you know, you have uh, plenty of time to, you, you can, you know, pick up the uh, Magnus and devices nice and, <laughs> nice and far back, you know, you can pick them up nice and quickly. Oh my god, you bastard, Hunter. Gravity gun. Okay, okay, okay. Quick, 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 quick. You can actually take out the striders with your rocket launchers. And that sometimes is a not a bad uh, method. <laughs> you can't always rely on Magnuson devices. Shit, one's close, one's real close. A companion hunter. Die. No, come back. <laughs> okay, now one more, one more. I believe one more hunter, and it's so close to the shacks. I don't even think I'm gonna put this in the vehicle unless okay there are hunters damn it you bastard oh my god die oh bastard something hit my magnuson no go back here magnuson device stop it you bastard. Oh god. <laughs> we did it! We have the bomb! Good work, everyone! Oh dear. Well. Oh wait, there's some more Attention! Attention! The new nodes, yay. The striders have been defeated! All personnel return to base immediately! Oh. Repeat! All personnel return to base immediately! That was a that was a shit performance. <laughs> I think that having the sawmill or not having the sawmill it changes drastically the your ability to combat the striders and knowing which ones are going to be the ones who are going to crab walk their way really quickly to the bases and ones that are, which ones aren't is also a huge factor cuz sometimes they just leisurely stroll and then sometimes they freaking sprint straight to the buildings and if you go for one that's just leisurely strolling and another one spawns that's going really freaking fast uh, you're gonna lose structure. There's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> Let's w listen to this. We made some small changes to our autosave system as a result of tuning the final Strider battle. 
Auto saves are right, the periodic yeah. checkpoints where we can restart the player's game after death so that they don't have to worry about replaying more of the game than necessary. In playtests, we observed that most players depended on our auto saves to restart after dying rather mm. than using their own quick saves. Yeah. But because the fight allowed players so much freedom, some players ended up with an auto save that left them in a no-win situation. Right, Low on health yeah. and pinned down by hunters, or too far from the base to defend the rocket in time, some players failed 30 or more times before finally giving up. <laughs> to address the no-win situation, we extended our autosave system to monitor health over time, and to only perform the autosave if the player was deemed safe for a reasonable period of time. Yeah. We also yeah. prohibited autosaves when striders were within a certain distance of the base. This ensured there was always enough time to defeat them. Right, right. So, if the strider was too close, and therefore the player wouldn't be able to get to them and destroy them in time, uh, it wouldn't autosave. Yeah, that's good. Okay, let's listen to this as well. To create a climactic finish to this level, we ramped up strider density and citizen presence, and then systematically destroyed outer installations in order to move the action as uncomfortably close to the base as possible. Mm. It was important to us that everybody be able to play to the end of the episode, but we also wanted them to feel that defeating the striders required a heroic effort. A balance had to be achieved between the feeling of being overwhelmed and the possibility of completing the level. Mm. We made many trade-offs to keep the experience enjoyable while keeping the intensity high, and sometimes this required removing enemies. For example, yeah. elite combine soldiers originally took part in this invasion, running in and around the striders and hunters, but this additional level of enemy fire impossible. proved frustrating for players, and so they were removed. Yeah, well, once again, dialogue got cut off. But yeah, the I think if they had foot soldiers in amongst all of that, it would have just been impossible. Like, it's already hard enough with just the hunters and striders. <laughs> Okay, so for the rest of the game, there is no more combat. So I just removed my gun from my screen so I can get better screenshots. Uh, but I want to keep the HUD on so that I can... So you can guys can still see the subtitles. So, yay! <laughs> we won! <laughs> yeah, all the guys, like, come out to greet you and cheer and... <laughs> yay! Gordon Freeman! This is, like, the first truly heroic thing that... Uh... Leg like, Freeman is legitimately done, basically, by himself. <laughs> like, Gordon Freeman's done a lot of things. I, I guess the first thing he did was destroying the Nilanth, defeating the Nilanth, which is pretty a pretty crazy feat to do by yourself. But a lot of the big events that were supposed to happen, the, you know, the big things, like taking out the air f purification, wow, air exchange thing, was removed, so... Come on. <laughs> Yeah, so now it's like, that's the, one of the f first, like, truly selfless and heroic things the Freeman has done. It's final stages. The portal's close to opening, but Dr. Magnuson sure will be a time to stop it. Complete. Tracking beacon. Oh, there's another bit of cruft we can ignore. Support equipment powered down. <laughs> Hold on a moment, Kleiner. Ah, Freeman. <laughs> well, I hey. see the Magnuson device performed flawlessly. I feel compelled to thank you personally <laughs> for saving my life. Uh -huh. So, um. <laughs> well, that's enough chit chat. I've got a rocket to launch. Yeah, so. A... Wow. For a minute there, I thought you were going to get a hug. Yeah. <laughs> check, check, check. Let's okay. go to the control room. We can get a great view of the launch from there. Did you do that? <laughs> Pause for a second. It constantly amazes me how many people are involved in creating her because everyone who is involved seems to have the same vision for her. And for so <laughs> many people to have one mind about a character, it, it blows my mind. I mean, very <sighs> rarely do I get a piece of direction or script that doesn't ring true to how I feel about Alex and vice mm. versa. And strangely enough, as soon as I try something out and something doesn't ring true, I'm usually not the first person to say it, even though I might be feeling it, somebody else will say it. And it's just, I guess, a testament to how, how in tune everybody is about what kind of person Alex is and what mm. she would do, what she wouldn't do, and, you know, what kind of girl she is. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's just all about... Well, here we are again. Yeah, here we are again. <laughs> Same elevator from the start of the game. Well, from the start of Half-Life 2. While you were out having fun, I found an old helicopter that I was able to get working. Oh. Out having fun. Up and ready to go. 
Never a dull moment, huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it's all about uh, understanding your characters and knowing what they should and shouldn't say. Knowing them rather than just being yourself. Hell of a job you did out there, son. <laughs> Everyone's so dark. <laughs> oh, what the? There's my, <laughs> there's my shotgun. Until after we have <laughs> launched our rocket. Now, I believe we're ready to start the auto sequence. I believe Gordon should have the honor. You'll hear no objection from me. <laughs> okay. It's all yours, Gordon. Yeah, so one second. <laughs> Let's listen to this. The launch of Magnuson's rocket ties directly into the rocket Gordon launched at Black Mesa. Mm, Here, the portal yeah. satellite array that opened a gate to Zen in Half-Life 1 has been repurposed to shut the Combine out. This is just yeah. another example of the way we constantly try to weave the old threads of the Half-Life story into the new episodes. Yeah, so basically this is... What we did in Half-Life 1 was we op we sent a rocket into space to open up, or to help uh, set up a... a I, think it's, I think it's something to do with setting up a frequency so that we can use that... Fr uh, that satellite's frequency to transfer ourselves back and forth between Zen, and that's what we need to activate it in Half-Life 1 in order to get to Zen so that you can then defeat the Nilanth. But uh, in this game what we're trying to do essentially is destroy that link because that we don't want to have access to Zen anymore. Or we don't want to have that rift that allowed us direct transportation between the two. We're trying to close it off. Because the Combine is currently using it as a way of getting to our world. So if we can destroy that link, then we might have a little bit more time to eventually find a way to stop them from coming all together. As we learn from Epistle 3, <laughs> that is not quite as straightforward as we thought. And, yeah, it might end up turning out that there's not much we can do about it. It's not really, we can't stop it from happening. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I restart it and every single one of them has like a million dialogue lines all at once. <laughs> it's another line that's from Gmod Idiot Box. No, I like the sand back here, so I can see everyone. It even has like the curve of an actual rocket. It's really cool. We need to reach altitude and transmit the signal. Too right. The clock is ticking. We couldn't have cut it any closer if that was our intention. <laughs> it is going to work, right? It has to. Once the rocket is in range of the portal, we'll be able to switch on the Xenium resonator. Well, let's get outside. I'd like a better view of the fireworks. There should be quite a show. Regrettably, I can't come out with you. Magnuson and I will need to keep a close eye on the rocket's trajectory. Aren't you going to yeah. see us off? I love that it has that. this is wrapped up, because basically, dream of letting you go without a proper goodbye. <laughs> okay, I'll hold you to that. You too, Dr. Magnuson. Indeed. <laughs> oh, it's kind of nice. Um, no, rockets have a trajectory. A moment, sweetheart. Gordon, hold on. Dog, there you are. <laughs> the more I think about that warning from our friend, the more I'm convinced it has to do with Borealis. Don't be deceived. Right. That ship must never be used. You have got to destroy it, whatever the cost. Where are you two? You're gonna miss it. Be right there, Alex. Gordon, thanks for everything you've done. For Alex, uh. for all of us. I couldn't be prouder if you were my own son. Now when you get back, we've got a lot to talk about. Come on. Uh. That is truly the last goodbye. Gordon, Alex, Dear look God, at the portal. This has to work. <laughs> Activated the resonator. 
Yeah, basically they're using this rocket to collapse this portal. Oh my goodness. Yes. Yeah. Oh my rocket. Oh. I'll bet the Combine aren't too happy right now. You got mm. that right, sweetheart. But we've got plenty to celebrate. Yeah. I wish you didn't have to head off so soon. If only it weren't so critical. It's okay, Dad. We'll find Judith and bring her back. Dog? Before we go. Oh, that's hey, right. Oh, uh, yeah. What a nut. Don't go too far. Dog, like, runs off. Because... Yeah. I'm gonna wait out here and hopefully they'll stop for a second and I can... Well, there she is. Oh, oh, she God damn it. Go. <laughs> How am I supposed to listen to these nodes? We have no idea what to expect. Yeah, there's the helicopter. We'll be all right. I just wish all this didn't have to fall on you, Alex. Your mother would be so proud. Dad. Uh, Come on, Gordon. The chopper's waiting for us. Okay. Before you do anything more. Okay. <laughs> we can go back. We can listen to this node. Episode 2's backgrounds or vistas are created in a manner that fuses traditional 2D animation techniques, using linear cards moving against each other to imply parallax, and a modern digital take which involves placing these cards in a 3D environment and manipulating their size and distance from camera depending on the scale needed. A series of cards can sit in front of a 3D skybox, and with the addition mm. of atmosphere or fog, a realistic result can be achieved. Yeah, so they're using a 3D skybox, but then they're layering it with 2D shaders and things like that to make and um just like 2d textures and the like to make it look as though it has a 3d like in this case a 3d portal spiraling um yeah <laughs> the scene is really cool and super super like emotional especially if you know what's going to happen in a minute it's all like everything seems to be turning up for once but it, as we all know it's not really the case Okay, let's listen to this one. Developing the Half-Life episodes allows us to steadily flesh out the details in an ongoing cosmic struggle. Most mm. of this conflict remains far in the background, but little by little, we are able to bring new elements up front. One of our goals for episode two was to fully develop the grub-like advisors first glimpsed in Half-Life 2. Yeah. In episode one, they make several brief appearances but have no direct effect on the events in the game. In episode two, we deliberated on how soon to show them becoming active and decided to pull back the veil in stages. Mm. Therefore, we first see them being hauled around by Combine troops, completely passive. Next, yeah. we see one waking up from incubation, still somewhat groggy, and beginning to discover its power. But by the end of the episode, the advisors come fully into their own, front and center, as characters mm. with a huge impact on the story. Yeah. I'm not gonna say anything about that. <laughs> To create the Eli death sequence, we talked it through in great oh. detail, wrote up an outline with all <laughs> the events we discussed, and then it. produced an animatic. We used rough sketches painted over screenshots and a variety of crude special effects and sounds to create a quick pre-visualization of how the scene would play out. Mm. Not only did this help us to converge on a shared vision for the scene, but by working rough we were able to quickly iterate until we had a design worth implementing in the game. Mm. The decision to kill Eli was not made lightly, and once we'd made it, we had to figure out how to make it meaningful. Yeah. We'd already established Eli's frailty as well as his importance to the Resistance and Alex's devotion to him. So from mm. a narrative point of view, the impact of his death seemed obvious. The hard part would be the execution. The advisor's pun ability to immobilize the player gave us a way to stage the scene. Then the animations and the sound design made it believable. But none of this would have been enough without inspired performances by Merle Dandridge and Robert Guillaume. Hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, I think I've already said this before, but uh, Guillaume is, has passed away since uh, episode 2's release, so Eli, in, in spirit and in, well, in game and in real life, has died. It's just like adds to the sadness of it all. This final episode 2 scene was yeah. unbelievable. Before we even started working on it, 
the team sat me down and they kind of did a little show and tell of the the rough animation that they had and mm. I think they were hesitant to show it to me but just from that rough animation I was so moved I mean yeah. just immediately moved to tears I felt like I'd just been gut punched and I, I immediately felt it I immediately felt it and I was like let's go let's let's get on this mm. so it, it shouldn't surprise me <laughs> It shouldn't surprise me by now, because I've been working on Alex for so long now, but every time we come to the table to do a new scene or, or uh, lay down some new material, I am always blown away. And this scene was just the epitome of that feeling. Um, I was so pumped to get in there and, and start working on it. And they're always upping the, upping the ante and always um, taking it to the next level, but this time, this scene is different. Because this time, Alex loses. Mm. Yeah. And I think this is a... I don't think. It is a major sacrifice. She, You see her carrying around the wounds of her mother that she lost, but yeah. her dad made her who she is. Her dad taught her. Her dad groomed her. And I think, most importantly, he loved her. And... Mm. Um, this script was a gift and a gut punch all in one. Um, I don't know. When you, when, you, when you give me something like that, it really motivates me to kind of try to knock it out of the ballpark. Mm. I love, love playing Alex. And I have to say, it's definitely my favorite acting job I've ever had, hands down. No. Oh. <laughs> I'm such a sap. So, mm. Dr. Kleiner gave us the Borealis coordinates. We'll keep the hailing frequency open on the chopper radio in case Judith tries to reach us again. Good idea. She could well make another attempt. Yeah. Oh no. Dad! Gordon! Help! Ah! I was gonna say, I'll just let it play out, but you can Dad. control the direction of the Alex. camera, so I won't just let it play out. Dad! Oh. Oh. Yeah, we get another reflection of this. Listen to Sorry, that chip. They're only interested in us. But then Eli does, Don't. you know, something selfless to try and help Dad, us. No! Dad! Dad! God damn it, let go of him! Yeah. It's another freaking advisor over here. Alex is so close to also being destroyed, but then a dog saves her. And I believe dog rips out his tongue, if I'm not mistaken. Dad. Or at least severely damages it. Dad. Dad. Dad, please. Dad. Oh my god. No. Yeah. That's how Half-Life 2 Episode 2 ends. <laughs> and that's the last thing we ever see of Half-Life 2. Or Half-Life, in general. And people wonder why people have such strong opinions about Episode 3. You know, it's, it became like a meme to be like, oh, Half-Life 3 episode, you know, or episode 3 confirmed or whatever, but for so much of us that have been fans, so, for so many of us who have been fans of Half-Life since Half-Life 1, it feels like, you know, a huge part of our, the narrative that we've come to love is just missing. Because they got to this point, they told such an amazing story up to this point. And then they've just left it. They've not done anything further with it. 
some I, w I wouldn't say it's necessarily like a cliffhanger but it's just an emotional gut punch at the end of episode two with no way to feel better about it there's no like vengeance for eli or whatever <laughs> yeah so yeah that's it that's the end of the half-life playthrough on this channel i've started with half-life one didn't play the I didn't play Opposing Force or Blue Shift because they're not technically canon. Or well, Blue Shift sort of is and has pieces that are canon. But then, yeah, I played Half-Life 1, I played uh, Half-Life 2 Episode 1 and Episode 2 now, all on the channel with developer commentary where applicable. Um, and I guess there's, I looked it up, there's still a couple more Valve games that have developer commentary. Left 4 Dead, I don't know if it's Left 4 Dead 1 or 2 or both. Um, and Team Fortress 2, of course. Team Fortress 2 has a very limited developer commentary mode. But I'll, I'll have to take a look at it. I'll have to check it out. But yeah, they might, they might end up being just like one-off episodes of developer commentary. But other than that, that's kind of it for Valve's developer commentaries. I don't believe they've done any other developer commentary stuff at all. Mainly because they haven't made any other games since then. Or nothing substantial. The, the Lab is a cool game, but it is just a series of mini-games. It's not like a fully-fledged game in its own. So yeah. <laughs> Until they come out with a new game, I will be kind of done with... After those, after Team Fortress 2 and Left 4 Dead, that'll be it for the developer commentary from Valve. If there are other games that Valve have, you know, non-Valve games that have de developer commentary that I know of and are, am interested in doing developer commentary for, you know, one that I can actually add my own two cents to, uh, then I will, I will consider playing them. But other than that, that might end up being it for the developer commentary on, the, on this channel. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. It's been a long time. I, I started the developer commentary way back at the start with the Portal 1 developer commentary. So yeah, we'll have to see how that goes. Only time will tell. <laughs> Whatever the case, if you like what you saw, hit like. If you want to see more from me, then subscribe. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, 